And just as a uh, reminder, so if we look at membrane potential at just one part of the cell, um, so one part of the axon, let's say, what we'll find is as an action potential propagates down that the length of the axon, you'll see this pattern. So on the uh, uh, y-axis here, we have delta MV, that's potential difference, or membrane potential, voltage in other words, like we talked about uh, last time, how a battery is an electrical difference, and so is uh, across the membrane there's an electrical difference too. Um, and then along the bottom we have time. So at the first thing that we see, which is this first part right here, is in order for an action potential to happen, the cell membrane has to get to minus 60. You know, its resting membrane potential is minus 70. So in order for anything exciting to happen, we have to get to minus 60. And that's accomplished through those graded potentials. Um, and at the end of uh, today's talk, you'll see some, with some more clarity, I think, of how you actually get from this minus 70 to minus 60. So once we hit minus 60, that's the threshold for most neurons. And at that point, the sodium channels pop open. Now, because sodium is much higher outside the cell than inside, when those channels open, sodium comes rushing in. And because sodium is a positively charged ion, if it's coming into the cell, we're going to see the cell membrane potential go up um, to past zero all the way up to plus 30. So this upstroke, this fast increase, that is the result of sodium channels being open and sodium coming in to the cell. Now when we get up here to plus 30, the sodium channels inactivate. In other words, they kind of plug themselves so that sodium can no longer pass through. At that same time, uh, because of the voltage, plus 30, the potassium channels open. So we have two things that happen at the top here. The sodium channels inactivate and the potassium channels open. Now, potassium is much higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. So potassium goes rushing out. Again, because potassium is a positive charge, as its positive leaves the cell, we see the cell membrane potential drop. So this downstroke here, this fast decrease, is the result of potassium channels being open and potassium going out of the cell. So the up is sodium coming in, the down is potassium going out. Now we go all the way down to minus 70, our baseline, and then below, almost down to minus 90. And once we get to this minus 90, that's the trigger for the potassium channels to close. So first the sodium channels uh, close and the um, potassium channels open, then the potassium channels close, and now what we see in this last little bit here is the cell returning to normal. Now because all this sodium moved and potassium moved, the cell isn't back to normal right here because all that sodium and potassium has moved around. So the sodium-potassium pump has to put things back in order again. It has to pump the sodium that came in out, and it has to pump the potassium that, uh, that left back in. So one of the reasons that neurons are such energy hogs, you know, they, have, they use a lot of ATP, is because this sodium-potassium pump has to always be putting things back in order, uh, making sodium high outside and low inside and potassium, vice versa. So that's the action potential at one spot. <clears throat> now, uh, action potential propagation is essentially um, one segment of cell membrane triggers an action potential in the next segment. And we talked about that last time, but we didn't get to the movie. So we're going to start today with the, uh, the action potential propagation film here. Okay. So let's go with that. Okay, oop, got started. Action potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Once an action potential is generated in the initial segment of the axon, it propagates the entire length of the axon. Recall that a threshold stimulus causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open. The influx of sodium ions generates an action potential.
it also establishes a depolarizing current that flows to the next segment and brings it to threshold. Voltage-gated sodium channels open, regenerating the action potential in this segment of the axon. Current flows from this segment and depolarizes the next segment to threshold, thus regenerating the action potential yet again. In this way, regeneration continues in one direction all the way down to the axon terminals. The basis for unidirectional propagation is revealed when we take a closer look. By the end of the depolarization phase of the action potential, all voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events render this segment of the axon temporarily insensitive or refractory to another depolarizing stimulus. However, voltage-gated sodium channels in the downstream segment are closed and receptive to a depolarizing stimulus. Thus, propagation occurs sequentially down the axon to the axon terminals. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of Rambier, occur at discrete intervals. Voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant in the nodes, but largely absent between nodes. So, action potentials are regenerated at each node, not in areas covered by the myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath does provide the insulation necessary for the rapid spread of depolarizing current. And the sooner the nodes reach threshold, the faster action potentials propagate along the axon. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast. Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. Nevertheless, both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary. Propagation of an action potential. Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. All right, so action potential propagation. The short version there is the, uh, uh, the segment of cell membrane that has an action potential ends up depolarizing or bringing to threshold the next section of membrane. So we have this kind of chain reaction that goes all the way down the axon. Yeah? How do um, the, the nodes get back to a regular since they don't have a lot of potassium? Um, Say sodium potassium pump again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the same thing that, that happens everywhere else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's do a question. Um, which of the following situation occurs in electrically excitable cells? Now, the reason it's said like that is that's both muscle and nerve cells. This is a true for. All right, I have to send you the question here in a minute. There. some spread on this question. Okay, the correct answer is C. So in muscle cells and in nerve cells, the thing that makes this happen, this dramatic change in membrane potential, 
is the sodium channels, voltage-gated sodium channels. When the cell membrane gets to minus 60, that triggers the sodium channels to open, and that amplifies the response. You know, if you're heading up towards minus 60, okay, the membrane potential is getting higher. But now when the sodium channels open, it goes way up because all that sodium comes rushing into the cell. So the correct answer there is C. Let's look at some of the others. So A, when sodium ion channels open, potassium ion channels close. No, when sodium ion channels open, um, the uh, potassium ion channels have to stay closed or else you wouldn't see this pattern. So first the sodium channels open, then the potassium channels open. <clears throat> so not, they're not uh, linked. And then, uh, let's see, um, the sodium-potassium pump is, uh, is opposite that. Sodium is moved out of the cell and potassium is moved in. So do remember that sodium-potassium pump in which direction things go. So it pumps sodium out and it pumps potassium in. All right, got another one. A change in resting membrane potential confined to a small area is which of those things? Talked about this at the beginning of last time. And I can tell that we should talk about it again, which we're going to do right now. All right, so a change in resting membrane potential that's in just a small part of the cell is not an action potential. The action potential. Um, uh, works over the whole neuron. So the, this small change is a local potential. So, and as we'll see at the end of today, you know, one neuron connects with another, and it, what it affects is not the overall, the whole cell, it only affects part of the membrane. And it can do so with neurotransmitters and create a local potential. Now, if we get enough local potentials to bring that axon hillock up to minus 60, then we'll get an action potential. So that's, um, the, the potentials are summed like that. And like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of today. All right, we'll do one more. Which of the following events is not a characteristic of an action potential? Jump in there, folks. Okay, good. Very good. Almost all of you got that. That's B. Why? Because what does it say? As sodium ions enter, the inside of the plasma membrane becomes more negative, and it's less negative. It becomes more positive as sodium ions enter. But these others are true. So at the beginning of the uh, action potential, the plasma membrane becomes highly permeable to sodium. So sodium comes rushing in. That's A. Um, at the peak there, the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. So we're going to get a movement in, in the other direction, from sodium coming in to potassium going out. So that uh, is repolarization. As potassium flows out, the membrane potential drops again. And then um, action potentials are all or none. The cell either fires or it doesn't fire. It's a principle of, of neurology and neurons is that nerve cells never half fire. They can only uh, do or not do, so to speak. All right. So the whole point of the uh, action potential 
is to send a signal down the length of that axon and to the synapse because it's at the synapse where the whole the purpose of the action potential is found. So um, eventually that action potential arrives at the very end of the axon. So those are the telodendria, right, where it branches at the end. And then at the very end of each telodendria is a synaptic knob. Now, there are uh, multiple types of neurotransmitters in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. A very common one is acetylcholine. But just because acetylcholine is what we're going to look at in the next few slides, that doesn't mean that all neurons use acetylcholine. There's a dozen or so different neurotransmitters that the brain uses. So, you know, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, um, you know, there's a long list, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, <clears throat> um, so there are lots of different types of neurotransmitters. Also, each neurotransmitter can have multiple types of receptors. So, for example, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. But there are receptors that are inhibitory and receptors that are excitatory for that same neurotransmitter. So we have a variety of neurotransmitters and we have a variety of receptors that can change the effects of those neurotransmitters. Turns out that brain chemistry is really quite complicated because there are lots of options. You know, one of the reasons that the brain is able to do all the amazing things it is is because it has a lot of variability in um, how it can affect, how one neuron can affect another. All right, so let's look at the, the steps at the synapse. So in step one, that action potential is, is still propagating down the membrane here. So, you know, at this spot right here, we're seeing that pattern occur as that electrical change sweeps down the, the membrane of the axon. Now, eventually, it's going to reach the end. So it's going to reach the synaptic knob at the end of the telodendria. Um, and once it does, we're going to have neurotransmitter release. But before that occurs, let's look at some of the things that are already present. So we have neurotransmitter in these synaptic vesicles. So it's already built, it's already packaged, it's ready to go. So that when this action potential arrives, this neurotransmitter can be released very quickly. You know, another way that neurons could work is to create neurotransmitter when that action potential comes. But that would be slow. So instead, it's already built. Um, here in the synaptic cleft, which is what we call the space between neuron, uh, the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, um, <clears throat> we have acetylcholinesterase. It looks like a little yellow moon here. We talked about this when we talked about the neuromuscular junction, when we talked about muscles. Acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine. So it helps to clear the synapse. It helps to clear the synaptic cleft after this neuron has fired and released its neurotransmitter. And then on the postsynaptic membrane, we have bolted or uh, chemically gated sodium channels or potassium channels. It can be either one. Um, so when these channels are activated, they're either going to increase the permeability to sodium or they're going to increase the permeability to potassium, which is going to affect the membrane potential. All right. So the action potential arrives, and as it reaches the end of the uh, axon, that voltage change triggers some calcium channels to open. Now, we don't talk a lot about calcium, but the truth is calcium is a major player in a lot of the uh, fancy stuff that the body does. So just like we saw calcium play a role in muscle contraction, it also has a critical role in, nerve, uh, in neuron functioning, too. So this action potential opens calcium channels. The calcium goes rushing in, because calcium is always higher outside the cell than inside. And that calcium rushing in is what triggers these vesicles to join up with the membrane and actually dump their contents then into the synaptic cleft. So acetylcholine is released in response to this action potential through the trigger of calcium channels. So calcium enters, acetylcholine is released. That acetylcholine will bind to these receptors and will make some change to the postsynaptic neuron's uh, membrane potential. So for example, let's say uh, we're looking at the postsynaptic cell, so the, the one being affected. It might have been hitting, sitting here at minus 70, 
And this uh, neurotransmitter release has now pushed the, the postsynaptic neuron's membrane potential up towards minus 60. If you have a lot of that happening, well, eventually that postsynaptic neuron is going to hit that minus 60 threshold and is then going to fire its own action potential. All right. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, I got a little ahead of myself there, but okay. So the acetylcholine crosses the synaptic cleft, binds to the sodium channels, causes the sodium channels to open. Sodium goes rushing in. So the uh, membrane potential here is now going to be closer to that minus 60 uh, threshold. Now we have to put things back the way they were. So um, almost immediately after acetylcholine is released, acetylcholinesterase starts to break it down so that uh, the effects on the postsynaptic cell are limited. You know, remember, the neuron wants to be quick. That means it has to turn on and turn off rapidly. So it turns on rapidly by that action potential, and it turns off rapidly by uh, destroying the neurotransmitter, as in the case of acetylcholinesterase, or reabsorbing it. Um, many neurotransmitters, including acetylcholine, uh, the way the, the cleft is cleared is the presynaptic neuron basically gathers it all back up so that it, it can then use it again if it wants. Um, but <clears throat> it, it clears that cleft so the uh, 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 effect is limited in time. All right. <clears throat> so all in one slide, here's our action potential, step one. That action potential triggers calcium channels to open. Calcium comes in. Calcium triggers the release of uh, the neurotransmitter from the synaptic vesicles. So the, the vesicles join and dump their neurotransmitter. At uh, point number three here, this is the receptor. So here it's a sodium channel that responds to acetylcholine. And then acetylcholinesterase breaks that neurotransmitter up so that this effect is limited in time. The, uh, the parts are then reabsorbed, acetylcholine is remade, and then now the neuron's ready to fire again because it has rebuilt its synaptic vesicles. All right. <clears throat> so there's a very rare kind of synapse in the body that works a little bit differently, and that's called an electrical synapse. This is about as close as we get in the body to an electrical type connection. You know, like a wire would be, like you find in your computers and your phones. You know, those are electrical connections. Charge flows from one thing to the next directly. And in these electrical synapses, we essentially have that effect. You know, an action potential propagates down here, and then through gap junctions, which we talked about a long time ago, um, <clears throat> that uh, action potential goes right to another neuron and triggers an action potential in that next neuron. Um, so this is from your book. These are so rare that you're not ever going to hear about them. So when you think about synapses, don't think about this kind. Think about the regular synapse with a cleft. Yeah. So the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, that's only necessary for, it's not necessary for like the neuron neurons. It's just when the neurons going to like muscles. Um, no, and neuron to neuron. Okay, so, so acetylcholine is used not only for nerves to talk to muscle, but nerves talk to nerves with acetylcholine too. But they're only at the synaptic ends. They're not yes. Like okay. Yes. Yes. They're only at the ends. All right. So EPSPs and IPSPs. All right. <clears throat> so the presynaptic neuron, its whole goal behind an action potential is to communicate or, or interact with the postsynaptic neuron. So the, the nerve before and the nerve after the synapse. Now, that interaction can either be excitatory or inhibitory. So if we have, we'll just try to make this simple here. So this is nerve A, right? And this is nerve B. So here's a synapse, right, to make it very simple. So this is our presynaptic neuron. This is our postsynaptic neuron. So uh, neuron A can excite neuron B. In other words, depolarize the membrane, push this push uh, neuron B up towards its threshold of minus 60. That would be excitatory. In other words, neuron A is trying to get neuron B to fire. Um, or neuron A can be trying to block neuron B from firing. 
Um, so that would be inhibitory. So typically, excitatory uh, interactions are, are, built, are built on the sodium channels, like we just saw in our example. Neuron A releases acetylcholine, and that causes neuron B to get closer to threshold. The inhibitory usually work on potassium channels. So let's say neuron A releases GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, and it causes uh, potassium channels on neuron B to open. Well, that's going to cause the membrane potential to go down instead of up, making it less likely that neuron B is going to fire. So the excitatory version, we call that an EPSP, an excitatory post or presynaptic potential. So neuron A is exciting neuron B. The IPSP is the inhibitory version. So uh, neuron A is inhibiting neuron B, so that's an inhibitory presynaptic potential. So in the, uh, the real nervous system, not the conceptual one, we have anatomy that looks a little bit like this. So underneath all of these extensions here, that's a nerve cell body, right? And here's its axon. So a single neuron might get uh, signals from thousands of other neurons. So each of these little feet here is um, the uh, uh, synaptic knob of, of a neuron. So potentially many, many different kinds of neurons. So uh, and all of them are either exciting or inhibiting neuron B, so to speak. Um, so if we were to look at the postsynaptic neuron, neuron B in our little um, uh, concept diagram over there, we would see that when an excitatory presynaptic potential is present, um, yeah, this should be, it should be postsynaptic. So make a correction to your notes, okay? On this EPSP, IPSP, this should be excitatory postsynaptic potential and postsynaptic potential here. That's my error. They're um, both postsynaptic? Yes, they're both postsynaptic because what you're looking at is the postsynaptic cell. So that's just so there's no confusion. All right. So if we look at the cell membrane um, in an area, uh, you know, like we'll pick a spot like here. So here, this neuron is interacting with this part of the neuron underneath it. So if we were to put our little voltmeter there, we might see something like this. So if it's an excitatory neuron, we'll see an increase in membrane potential, right? From minus 70 to minus 65, let's say. If it's an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, we'll see a, a decrease in membrane potential. Because remember, this is closer to threshold. Minus 60 is where big things are going to happen, action potential. And this is further from minus 60. So, uh, and the, they can also balance each other out. Let's say there's two neurons that are affecting the same spot. If one is inhibitory and one is excitatory, we may end up with no effect at all. So they cancel each other out. So the EPSPs are bringing uh, the neuron closer to minus 60, the IPSPs further away. All right. So when you have all of these different inputs to this one neuron, you know, how does the cell decide when to fire and when not to fire? Well, it's all about that threshold of minus 60. If the sum total of all these interactions brings this underlying cell to minus 60, it's going to fire an action potential. If it doesn't reach minus 60, it's not going to do anything. So this is it's the lowest level of information processing in the nervous system, and that is does an individual neuron fire or not fire? And that determination is based on the, the sum of all the inputs from the other neurons that affect this neuron. So um, we have IPSPs and EPSPs. And if the axon hillock right here, if it reaches minus 60, this neuron is going to send its action potential down to the next cell. All right. So there are... Uh, Two ways that, um, that uh, inputs from different neurons can be added up or summed. One is in uh, time and one is in space. All right. So here we have a, a postsynaptic neuron, presynaptic neuron. So neuron A from our picture, neuron B. 
A and B. All right, so neuron A stimulates neuron B. Now, if it then stimulates neuron B again short, a short time later, it always takes a little bit of time for the membrane to get back to normal. So if we stimulate once and then we stimulate again, we may bring the axon kill to threshold, push it over that minus 60 uh, uh, mark, and then that action potential is going to fire. So we call that temporal summation, or summation over time. Now, the other version is spatial summation. Here we have three neurons. So we have two presynaptic neurons and a postsynaptic neuron. So let's say that these two neurons both fire an excitatory uh, uh, action potential at the same time. Because they are near each other, this region of membrane is going to have more of an effect than if either one of these had fired alone. So, you know, two is, is more than one. So if we get two firing neurons at the same time, that too may bring the axon hillock to threshold and cause this neuron to send an action potential. So in that first part of our action potential diagram here, this piece right here, and that is getting the cell to its threshold, this happens because of inhibitory and excitatory postsynaptic potentials and how they're summed up in, across the cell membrane in space or in time. So um, that's why I wanted you to pay particular attention to this uh, initial segment or axon hillock because this is the area of membrane that is going to determine whether that cell fires an action potential or not. If the axon hillock reaches minus 60, you'll get an action potential. If it doesn't, you won't get an action potential. So it sort of all comes down to this uh, first segment right here. All right. So neurons, in order to do the fancy things they do, they work in groups. You know, the, uh, some of the simplest actions the body makes, which are reflexes, may, might involve as few as three neurons. But that isn't most of the things we do. Most of the things we do involve thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons all interacting. So there are a variety of ways that neurons can affect each other. You know, this whole action potential business, that's one primary way that, that one neuron can affect another. You know, action potential, neurotransmitter release, that neurotransmitter binds to a receptor and affects the membrane potential of the next neuron. Um, but there are other ways as well. Um, there are regulatory neurons, you know, like uh, this guy. This neuron can affect how this neuron affects this neuron. Does that kind of make sense? It can change how this presynaptic neuron affects the postsynaptic neuron through its own action potential. Um, we also have, uh, there are hormones that regulate brain chemistry as well and can increase or decrease the activity of neurons either on a very specific way or in a more general way. You know, like one of the reasons we get sleepy at the end of the day is because there are regulatory hormones that are sort of calming the brain down and putting it into that sleep mode. So there are lots of different ways neurons can interact. One of the most common patterns in the nervous system is that uh, magnitude, bigger, smaller, faster, slower, heavier, lighter, those kinds of things, magnitude is often coded by frequency. In other words, an action potential can fire once, which happens, but more often action potentials fire at a frequency, you know, tick, 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 tick. And the faster it ticks, that means more or, or a greater magnitude of the signal that's being responded. So let's say I gave you a five pound weight, you know, and you're somewhere in your brain there's a neuron that's ticking like this. If I double the weight, it'll tick twice as fast to convey that information through the brain. So typically more action potentials per minute or per second um, uh, means a higher magnitude, slower means uh, less magnitude. Like we saw in muscle, you know, one of the ways that the brain gets muscle to contract harder is to send signals faster, because the faster the signals, the more the contraction builds up. So it's just one example of how uh, information is coded in the brain. All right. So where are neurotransmitters released from? 
maybe it's going to go. There we go. All right, we got kind of a split decision between B, C, and D. All right, so neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic terminal. They cross the synaptic cleft to arrive at the postsynaptic membrane. So where are they released? C, the presynaptic terminal. So um, that's just another name for the synaptic knob or the, uh, uh, the telodendria. All right. Receptor molecules, what are true about those? So the presynaptic neuron can have either an excitatory or inhibitory effect on the postsynaptic neuron. What determines whether it will be excitatory or inhibitory is what uh, receptor, um, what the receptor on B does. So the, the postsynaptic membrane uh, receptors. The correct answer here is D. It's the receptor molecule that determines whether that neurotransmitter on that particular cell is going to be excitatory or inhibitory. Because the, the brain reuses neurotransmitters. So like one part of the brain may use serotonin as an excitatory neurotransmitter. Another part of the brain may use the very same neurotransmitter, serotonin, but have it be an inhibitory instead. Typically, the excitatory receptors are sodium channels, because when sodium channels open, the neuron gets closer to threshold. Inhibitory uh, receptors are usually potassium channels, um, because potassium channels open, and they push the membrane potential even lower than resting and further away from threshold. All right. All right. When a neurotransmitter binds to its receptor, and increases the permeability of the postsynaptic membrane to sodium ions. Which of those things is true? seconds jump in there very good a lot of you are really getting this okay so the answer there is C what is a sodium you know if a neurotransmitter increases the permeability to sodium ions what's going to happen well sodium is going to come rushing in and the cell is going to the next cell the postsynaptic cell is going to get closer to its threshold so yes an excitatory postsynaptic potential is usually a sodium receptor, a sodium channel that has a chemical receptor on it. Um, 
the membrane will be hyperpolarized. You'd see that with potassium um, uh, channels instead. Chloride ions, even though chloride is around all the time, it doesn't really participate in very much physiology in the body. There's a few spots in the digestive tract, but that's about it. So it's all about sodium and potassium. All right. And that's it. We're done early today. Um, questions about anything? Anything you want to go over while we have 10 minutes? No? Okay. So I'll see you all in lab uh, today and tomorrow. Do we have these reactions?